Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Facebook Live today. I'm so glad to see so many of you in the audience, and I see more joining every minute. So it looks like we'll have a large crowd today. Thank you, everyone, for joining. If you're in our audience today, let us know where you're joining from and uh, leave us a comment and let us know if this is your first Facebook Live that you're joining us. Uh, at first my heritage Facebook live or if you've been to a few to a bunch of them live We'd love to hear how you're enjoying our Facebook live sessions If you are new to our Facebook live sessions uh, We've been hosting these since around March 2020 uh, almost uh, almost consistently two Facebook lives a week to uh, bring you all uh, engaging and interesting uh family history, genealogy content in your own home, from the comfort of your own home or, or wherever you are, whether it's at work, at home, uh, on your way, in the car. So uh, we've been bringing you some fantastic genealogy content from experts around the world. And uh, we're so excited to continue to do so throughout 2021 as well. Uh, if you'd like to go back and look at our previous sessions, you can go to the My Heritage Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash myheritage. And under the video section, you'll be able to take a look there and um, watch all of our previous uh, recorded sessions. Uh, and if you missed any of today's session, you can go back and rewatch it as well. So just uh, wanna let you know that they are all available there. I know we get a lot of uh, a lot of comments in every Facebook Live, oh, I missed something or I wanna rewatch it. So don't worry, it's all available after the session. It will be available on the My Heritage Facebook page. So um, before we get to today's show, I just wanna let you know um, about a couple things that we have going on at my heritage. So a couple of really exciting announcements. Uh, you know how things are at my heritage, always something going on, <laughs> very exciting times. So in honor of Valentine's Day, which is coming up very soon, uh, which might be a little bit different this year, maybe smaller celebrations, perhaps you live somewhere where you won't be able to um, go out to dine uh, but nonetheless we are going to be celebrating in full force at my heritage for valentine's day we'll be offering free marriage records on my heritage from february 10th to february 16th so in two more days they'll be open uh, and that'll be available for you we'll put a link in the comment section so you can take a look keep it handy bookmark that link and uh, starting in two days from now on February the 10th, the marriage records on my heritage will be open. So that'll be great. You can uh, research your ancestors, um, marriage records, and see what you can find there. So that's very exciting news. In addition, we have a Valentine's Day competition going on at my heritage. What we're asking is for all of you to share your family wedding photos, whether it be your parents, your grandparents, aunts, uncles, or even your own wedding photos, um, and to put them through the MyHeritage photo tools. So we have some fantastic photo tools on MyHeritage. That's the MyHeritage Photo Enhancer, um, at, which puts uh, brings the photos into focus. And then we have the MyHeritage in color, which colorizes black and white photos. But if your photo was already in color and it's just faded or has turned yellow over the years, it will also restore the original colors in your photo. So uh, run your wedding photos that you have uh, in your family, run them through the MyHeritage photo tools, and then share them with us on MyHeritage on social media using the hashtag love and full color and uh, or send them to us at stories at myheritage.com. I see that we already put a link in the a link in the comment section to the blog post which explains all the details of how to do that. Um, so please enter your photos and you have a chance of winning a MyHeritage Complete Plan or a MyHeritage DNA kit. So uh, we'll be giving away fantastic prizes. Uh, please take a look and enter your family's wedding photos. We'd love to see them in time for Valentine's Day. Um, so now for today's session, we have a draw at the end. Uh, just a minute ago, the My Heritage Complete Plan. For those of you who don't know, it's the best plan 
that we have to offer at MyHeritage. Uh, it comes complete with access to 13 billion historical records, as well as unlimited family tree size and unlimited access to all of our photo tools that MyHeritage enha um, enhancer, photo enhancer, MyHeritage in color, and the new restoration feature. So an excellent, excellent prize. And to win, all that you have to do is throughout today's show, uh, let us know something new that you've learned in today's show and leave a comment in the comment section or uh, write a question, a question or a comment, and you'll be entered in today's draw. So we're looking forward to see your comments and questions, and we'll be giving that draw at the end of today's show. Um, so now to our guests, we're really, really excited about today's session. We have with us Gina Philibort Ortega, and she's an author, researcher, instructor, and her focus is genealogy, uh, social and women's history. And uh, today she's going to be talking about family history in the kitchen. So a really interesting and exciting topic that we haven't covered in any of our Facebook lives before. So uh, we're really, really thrilled. Uh, hello, Gina. Hi, Esther. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. I love this topic. And so it's exciting to talk to everybody. And as I'm watching the chat, all the people from all over the world. So everybody's going to have a different take on this topic. Yeah, it's amazing to see, uh, you know, how global these sessions can get. And uh, I love that. I love seeing people from all over a different weather. I see here Julie's writing that it's cold and snowy in Alberta, Canada. <laughs> So no, no matter where you are, no matter what the weather is, uh, welcome to all of all of the viewers. We're so excited to have you with us today. So um, should we bring up your slides? Okay, let's do it. So hold on just a second. Okay, let me just put those in. There All right. Go. So, so how does that look? Perfect. Okay. So we're ready? Yeah. Take it away. Well, hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. And I want to talk about a topic that we don't really, in my opinion, give enough attention to in the world of genealogy, and that is food. And really, if you think about food, there's so much you could do with uh, family history and food. And, you know, increasingly we talk about that we want to tell the story of our ancestors' lives. And food is one way that we can do it. Now, if you're a fan of uh, that show Iron Chef, you may have heard this uh this little uh, saying before by a French foodie, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. I think that is very appropriate for genealogy as well. Because in a lot of cases, if you tell me what you eat, I can tell you stuff about where you're from, your family background, and all kinds of things. So food is something that we can use not only to learn more about primarily our female ancestors' lives, those lives that aren't as documented as well. It's also a way that we can learn more about our families and get a sense of our families. So I want you to think for a second about food in your family. You know, think about your favorite foods. Think about maybe memories you have of food. Um, I don't know about your family, but every time I make deviled eggs, and I don't know if deviled eggs is really an international thing, but uh, anytime I make that, they are quickly snapped up. That's like one of those foods that you expect at maybe, a, you know, a special occasion of some sort. So I want you to think about maybe a food memory that has to do with a special celebratory meal. And that might be Thanksgiving, if Thanksgiving is uh, celebrated where you are. It might be another holiday, a birthday, maybe Sunday dinner. So think about that. Now, if this is a dinner that you have uh, been a part of, from the time you were a kid, think about how that dinner changes over time. How was it when you were a kid versus how is it now? 
uh, is the foods different? Maybe you don't have certain foods. In my family, when I was young, my great grandmother would make mincemeat pie. And I know that is a favorite for some people, but that has uh, definitely gone out of favor in, in my family. So think about how that meal has changed. Think about who used to join you for that meal and maybe who's not around anymore. What do you remember about those gatherings? Did you have something that you did? Did you eat on certain plates? Did you bring out the nice silver and the tablecloths and the candles? Think about all those family heirlooms that may have been a part of that meal. Those are all things that you could write about as a genealogist. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's not genealogy, but it is helping to bring our ancestors to life and helping our families understand what life was like when we were younger versus today, for example. So why should you add food to family history? And this is a huge topic, and obviously we could go on for days, which would make me happy, but maybe not all of you. <laughs> but let's talk about why you would add food. You may find names and genealogically relevant information. I'm going to give you an example of one way that you might find genealogically relevant information. Uh, and food is mentioned in all kinds of documents. If you have read the Legacy blog, on Friday, I posted about a probate, an estate file, where the gentleman owed the local grocery store for food they had purchased over many months. And so it listed the food that they bought. And so Esther's going to put that link in the chat for you. But that's one way that food intersected with a genealogically relevant document. Food can be a great jumping off point for an interview. Now, if you haven't interviewed your family members, you need to do that. Even if you're the oldest generation, cousins, siblings, they remember things differently than we do. And so interviewing them can be extremely important. And so food is a good way to start that. You can talk about a meal that you remember being with them. You can talk about one of those celebratory uh, uh, meals. If it's an older person, you can ask them about what was food like when they were a child. If they had gone through, you know, uh, a, a financially hard time, that's something you can ask. If they lived in a different country. So there's all kinds of ways that you can use food as a jumping off point. Food also helps us understand a place in time. Food changes just like we all change and life changes and technology changes. And what we like to eat today is not what uh, our families ate before. Some of it's going to be similar, but things that maybe my mother ate in the 1950s, for example, is going to be a lot different than what we eat today. In fact, I'll tell you one family uh, food story we have is uh, my mother had twin brothers and they decided they wanted to raise pigeons, that this was a really good idea. Uh, they did not take care of those pigeons. And my grandmother decided that if they weren't going to take care of them, they were going to be dinner. Now, that wouldn't happen at my house. But when you think about, and when I think about my grandmother, she was a, a young widow, you know, they didn't have a lot. It makes some sense. Food and what people tell you about food might lead to records. And I'm going to give an example of that later on in our time together. But just like that probate, uh, that food, you know, that went with some genealogical records. So sometimes food stories can lead us to other records. It's also a great way to document family heirlooms. So what have you or someone in your family inherited? Maybe silver or china or a special tablecloth. I have one from my grandmother. Uh, maybe serving platters. There's all kinds of food-related heirlooms that we may gather and we can document those and make sure that when they're passed on to later generations, they understand the significance of those. Food can also help us better understand family traditions. Maybe in your family, there's some kind of cake recipe that does not use 
uh, flour, for ex example, or it's missing some key element of cake baking, and it's something your grandmother or your great grandmother passed on, that might indicate that they were without that commodity during a time like war or famine, for example. And so they had to make some substitutions. So sometimes that tradition that might make it sound like that they were ahead of their time really has to do with the fact of the time they were in and what they had to make do with. So sometimes food helps us understand that better. In fact, Esther and I were talking about how sometimes the way we grow up and feeling very strongly about wasting food, that might come from the way your parents or your grandparents and their experiences that might have been passed down to you. Now, Obviously, when we think about food, we think about things like cookbooks and recipe cards and those things that may you may have inherited or, uh, you know, maybe your grandmother told you or showed you how to make certain things. And that is a part of food history. There's much more to it, though, than just that. Uh, obviously, there's heirlooms that may have been passed down to you or stories that had to do with food or traditions. So there's a lot of things we can think about as we try to gather those food-related family history stories. Now, what does food tell us about our families? It actually does tell us something. So for example, something called food ways, which has to do with uh, food in a place and time. So what my family was eating in Southern California in the 30s is going to be different, slightly different than what a friend's family in Boston was eating during that time period. And there's going to be other factors as well. But for a large amount of time, food was regional. And so what was available here in California, where we have a great climate and we can grow fruits and vegetables and all kinds of things, is going to be different than what's available in a place where there's a winter, for example, and there's snow and there's not a lot of growing going on. So that tells us something. It tells us about time and place and what is popular during a certain time and place. Foods that are eaten during wartime, for example, that's going to be a little different because of short supplies or a lack of um, workers in the farm industry or rationing, for example. So food might hint towards time and place. It also might hint towards migration. So if your family migrates to, let's say, another country, they bring their food traditions with them. And they may not be able to make everything exactly as they were in their home country because of what's available, but they're going to try and they're going to adapt their recipes according to that. And we see lots of examples of that. In fact, um, there's a great book by a woman named Laura Shinoni. It's called uh, The Lost ravioli recipe of Hoboken. And it talks about her Italian family who comes to the United States and uh, their ravioli recipe is a little non-standard. It's not what you would make in Italy. And so she talks about her quest to find out why the very American cheese that's used in the ravioli recipe, why that came to be. So it's family history and it's food history. Food might also give an idea of values. If you're a part of a specific religion that has different uh, food restrictions or uh, that teach that you only eat certain foods, that reflects on your family's values. So for example, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists are vegetarian or the Mormons that they don't uh, take coffee or uh, alcohol. So things like that can reflect your family values. Food connects generations. That's where we get together as different generations. That's where we talk and we laugh and we celebrate. And so food plays a very important part in families. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is food isn't always good, right? Sometimes uh, we have family members that are awful cooks, but that's still good for a story. Or we have times that have been very desperate in our families and there has been famine or war where we have food restrictions.
So all of that is part of our family story. And then lastly, food might lead to records. And I know this is hard for us to understand because, uh, you know, we think about genealogy records, they have nothing to do with food. But there are some food-related genealogy records. In the U.S., we have the agricultural schedules to the U.S. Census. And that tells all about our family ancestors, our farmer ancestors, and what they were growing and raising. So uh, I gave you that, I showed you uh, that probate example. There's other examples as well that might give you a sense of your family or may document your family. So how do we incorporate food history into our family history? Well, recipes is one way, right? Documenting the recipes that are familiar in your family, getting them down on pen and paper, making them, taking photos or doing a video, sharing them in some way so that that pie recipe from grandma makes it down to your grandchildren or your great grandchildren. There's a lot of people who are doing that uh, right now. They're, they're writing blog posts about their family food ways. They're writing books. In fact, there's a Russian blogger who has done a wonderful job. Um, she has a book called The Soviet Diet Cookbook, she has an Instagram account and a blog about that cookbook. Uh, it's readily available online. Uh, she has taken this cookbook that her grandmother would have used, and she makes recipes from it, and she interviews her grandma about it. She's done a great uh, job of melding that family history and that food history. So it's called The Soviet Diet uh, Cookbook, and her name is Anna Kors Korsavia. Of course, I, I don't know Russian. So, but if you do the Soviet diet cookbook, you can find it. Some people have created cookbooks, family cookbooks, and that's one way that you can take your family history and your food history. You can include not just what we would expect in a cookbook, but you can include images, you can include stories, uh, all kinds of things. You can document heirlooms that you have inherited that tell something about your family's food history. You can write down memories that you have or a family member has as you do interviews. You can document the tools that your family used for their food. So maybe mixers, for example, or those meat grinders that used to hook on the kitchen counter and then you would grind it to make ham salad or, or something else. You can document your family's gardens. Did they have gardens during wartime, for example, and they canned what they produced? Uh, maybe they've always had a garden or maybe there's something special in the garden that has to do with where they're from or something they ate as a child. Maybe you have an ancestor that worked in a professional food occupation. So maybe they were farmers or cooks or, you know, wait staff, whatever it is. Maybe they canned foods uh, and sold it. So those are things that you can document and talk about. It's also important that we think about food not just as this joyous thing and that we enjoy and and all of that kind of good stuff, but we also document the hard times. And historically, food has played a role in the hard times our ancestors have experienced, whether that's wartime, whether it's famine, whether it's an economic depression, or just a financial hardship for a family. So that plays a part as well. And I think it has something to teach us when we document those times. Now, I want to give you a few examples, and I know we have a worldwide audience, and so some of these might seem specific to where I'm at, but I'm going to try to make it a little bit more open to everybody. So um, just think about how this might relate to your own research. Now, I want to start with talking about cookbooks. And when we think about cookbooks, we often think of those cookbooks that are general how-to guides that we all use to cook from and learn to cook from. 
And while those are important to our family history, I mentioned uh, Anna's blog and what she's done with a general Russian cookbook that would have been very familiar to women in the 40s and 50s. There's other types of cookbooks as well. So let me just give you some examples of other types of cookbooks. And let me say this about those general cookbooks. And I know Anna talks about this on her blog. Uh, when you look at a general cookbook that would have been familiar to people in your grandmother's time or before, I think it's important to remember, just like today, that that was a guide. It wasn't necessarily something that everybody ate from. And so it doesn't reflect the total food ways of a people. Just like today, you might pick up a cookbook from a celebrity chef. That doesn't mean that we all eat what is in that cookbook. It's, it's their ideas of what's a good meal, for example. So sometimes that doesn't tell us a lot about a particular time and place, although it may give us a sense of what was available to eat and what were the ways that people cooked and what was recommended. But there's other cookbooks and styles of cookbooks as, as well. So for example, prior to the printing of uh, you know mass quantities of books, there were things like manuscript cookbooks. And these are kind of like keeping a diary, but it's a cookbook where your family would have written in recipes, women that you knew would have written in recipes, and you would have used that as a guide to cooking for your family. Now, these recipes would have not only been for food and meals, but they would have also been for taking care of your family, uh, you know, medical needs, cleaning, those kinds of things, because those would have been passed down as well and would have been important for women as they married and they kept house. So these are uh, cookbooks that are going to be handwritten. They're going to be maybe bound or loose papers. Sometimes that would be a home source that you might have. I think about even today where I inherited a cousin's uh, cookbooks and in it was a folder with just all these different recipes and handwritten, some torn from magazines. That's kind of an example of a modern day manuscript cookbook. Now, there were also cookbooks aimed towards professionals, as well as those aimed for housewives or women cooking for their families. There's community cookbooks, and I'm going to stress that because that's an example of where women's names are in them, so we're going to come back to that. There's children's cookbooks. Some of you may have been given a cookbook as a child. And that's something where the food is geared towards what children like to eat. The ability to cook it is made simple. Um, so that's something you might have inherited. There's classic cookbooks. Uh, the Joy of Cooking is one example here in the United States. And where you are, you can probably think of other examples as well. Historically, probably... Uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, there have been women who have taught others how to cook, whether that's through uh, presentations or TV or radio or cookbooks. And so that's something that women would have, uh, you know, used, especially for special occasions. There's ethnic cookbooks. Uh, these might be cookbooks that were meant to help immigrants learn how to cook in their new homeland. Or... Uh, people who created cookbooks to teach another population about their food. So in the United States, that might be, for example, the Settlement House Cookbook or early Chinese food cookbooks. When people bought various foods or various kitchen tools, they would have got a recipe bo booklet or could have written to a company to get a recipe booklet, and that would have taught them how to use that appliance or that food, especially as foods were introduced like baking powder or, uh, for those in the U.S., Crisco, uh, you know, recipe booklets would have helped them understand how to use that product. There's obviously celebrity cookbooks or compilations of celebrity recipes. That's something that we see, you know, in the early 1900s. Sometimes they're done to raise money. Sometimes it's just a way to sell cookbooks. 
There are specific foods that are uh, in cookbooks that are just focused on that vegetarianism, for example, uh, maybe eggs, everything you wanted to know about eggs, and that's put out by the egg industry. There's diet cookbooks, institutional cookbooks like the Army, and then restaurant cookbooks. So you get an idea. There's all kinds of cookbooks out there. Some of these aren't going to reflect what our families truly ate. It might be what they aspire to eat or what was available during that time period. Because, for example, we might forget that they didn't always have refrigeration, for example, or that the temperature wasn't always on the stove knob or the oven knob. So so there's different ways that people learn to cook based on what was available. So what do those cookbooks provide? And as I start talking about a specific kind of cookbook, you can think about those historical food ways. What was available during that time and place? What technology for cooking was available? Are they using a pestle and mortar? Are they using uh, a wood stove? What are they using to prepare and cook foods. What cooking methods are people using? That changes over time. The way I cook food today is different than the way my grandmother cooked food. Cookbooks tell us what was acceptable to eat or ingest, and that changes over time. If you pick up a 19 or uh, yeah, 19th century cookbook that talks about how to uh, cook for the ill, it may uh, tell you to cook with something that today we know is poisonous. So I wouldn't always recommend using those recipes. And then, like I said before, cookbooks help primarily women understand how to take care of their families via sickness or just cleanliness. So I'm going to give you an example of cookbooks that women would have cooked from and that tell us a little bit more than just general cookbooks. And that is something called community cookbooks. Now, these are also called fundraising cookbooks, church cookbooks, charity cookbooks. Primarily, they were used to raise funds for different groups. They were not just in the United States. They were in other countries as well. And they were a way that women could raise funds for uh, causes that they cared about. Now, why I want to focus on this, and actually we could have also uh, looked at newspaper recipes, is these are recipes that women themselves provided. They ate that food. So it tells us a little bit more about what people were eating. Now, uh, the first community cookbook in the United States was in 1864. It was during the American Civil War. There are these cookbooks in other countries as well. Some of them had them slightly before or slightly after, but they're about this time period because remember, they're compiling recipes and having that published in some way. Uh, at that time period, it would have been a hardback. So there would have had to have the, the money and the availability to do that. Now, we know that in the United States, there were thousands of these books by the 1920s, but we don't know exactly how many because they're often seen as an ephemeral source. So let me explain that. These are cookbooks that are often seen as kind of weird. <laughs> They often have recipes that not everybody thinks is great and that doesn't um, age well. So today, looking at one of these books from 1910, there would be very few recipes you might find appetizing. So people throw them away. So we don't know how many women contributed recipes or how many there are because they were often thrown away. It's not until really present day that people have seen them as an important archival source and important to telling. Uh, the story of women's lives. So why I wanted to talk about this is this is a cookbook that provides the organization's name, who published it, the date, the place, some history, advertisements. They are city directories of women. And I'm going to show you what I mean about that. So it tells us something about the women who gave those recipes, and these are everyday, normal women in your families. So it gives their names, it gives their role in the organization in some kind, in some uh, instances, or it shows you that they were a member of that organization. 
There might be a photo. This is very rare, but there are some that have photos. It may give you familial relationships or clues. It might even give you uh, clues to ethnic background or religious background. Now, these were cookbooks that were put out by churches, uh, schools, fraternal orders, uh, Junior League, which is a, uh, a group here in the United States, different professional groups like home economic teachers, societies and organizations, libraries, nonprofits. You get the idea. Any kind of group that wants to raise money for their organization. Now, that doesn't mean that they were all for fundraising. Sometimes churches or families put these uh, cookbooks together just to put them together as kind of a, you know, let's, um, let's share, you know, let's share these recipes and, you know, we're a community. But largely they were used as fundraisers. So let me just show you a few examples so you get a sense. This is one from 1876, and I didn't show it, but it's a bound volume. Most people who hear about these cookbooks think about those uh, plastic comb spines, but they're not all like that. This is from Des Moines, Iowa, the Ladies of Plymouth Church. So it is a fundraising cookbook for their church. Cookbooks used to have recipes for uh, people who were sick in your family so that you could care for them. And so here is something that you could use to care for the sick people in your family in 1876, wine jelly. So either that would cure you or you would be so drunk that you wouldn't care, I guess. So this is an example of one of those sections of uh, food for sick people. I think it's funny, there's four or three women who submitted those recipes. And then there's uh, someone who put in toast water, which is exactly what you think it is. It's toast in water. And so uh, that's a very common recipe for people who are sick. Here's a cookbook for uh, that was put together by some people in politics, and it includes senators and congressmen's wives and all sorts of people. And so here's an example of a recipe giving you some more uh, information about this family. This was submitted by the senator from Nebraska. I think this is in the 1980s. And it's for cookies. And you can see it yields 50 cookies. So that's a lot of cookies. And she explains that it's her husband's favorite recipe. His mother had 11 children. And so she made them because they were inexpensive, easy, and nutritious. And so she gives a little family history there with her recipe. Now, not all of these cookbooks do this, but some do. This is a cookbook that's done by some home economic teachers from Canada and the United States. In fact, uh, I think we have somebody from Alberta. The one in the middle is from Alberta. Salmon lima bean casserole. Now, this kind of shows you how taste evolves over time. I'm not sure many of us would want that. Maybe some people would, but um, it shows you, you know, the diversity in the recipes here. The other thing is you can see, uh, I know we have somebody from Greece. There's one called Greek fish. I'm not really sure that's a real Greek recipe. Uh, often when we see those kinds of recipes, um, there's something about it, like this one has some lemon juice that makes people call it uh, Greek or whatever, when it really isn't. This is a cookbook that's put on by the Slovenian Women's Union of America. This group still exists, but I think they have um, uh, gone together with another group. And you can see there's two recipes here, uh, and what or both of them have the address of the person who submitted it. So what does the city directory have for us? It has names and addresses. This community cookbook has the same thing in it, plus the um, added benefit of knowing that they were uh, higher up. They held a, a board position in this group. Now, 
cookbooks sometimes included advertisements, and this was to help offset the price of printing. They were fundraisers, and people would buy those cookbooks, but in order to uh, submit it to a printer, they had to have money, so they would do ads. And often these ads include businesses that women owned, so they can be extremely important and a nice addition to your city directory searching. And they had all kinds of ads. As you can see, this is from a cookbook and it's for funeral directors and it's all about caskets and everything else. Now, what does this do for your genealogy? Well, you're not just getting those recipes, but you're getting a little directory of what was around during that time period. And some of them might be advertisements for something your ancestor owned. And then lastly, churches put together cookbooks, and sometimes they kind of did a lot with their cookbook, including a directory and a history like this one. This is called Historic Paxton, Her Days and Her Ways, 1722 to 1913. Now, the first part is uh, a history of the church, but the second part is the recipes. Now, this is one of my favorites, and I'm going to show you why, because as genealogists, you can appreciate this. There's a chapter about the graveyard and people buried at the graveyard. That's in the cookbook. Now, that shows you how cookbooks are such an important resource as we think about putting together our family's lives. We can't ignore them. They might provide us a name because they do these these kinds of cookbooks are like city directories or they might provide us some insight into what was available food wise what people were eating and also about what was going on in that time and place now as you research these cookbooks uh often they're a home source you know our family passes them down or buys them or whatever but obviously libraries might have collections newspapers are an important food history source for our families because women in the united states uh probably canada as well and some other uh, countries would submit questions for people to answer about food. They would submit their food recipes. They would enter contests that way. So newspapers are an important resource for our family food history. And then lastly, digitized book websites are as well. And you're familiar with many of these, I'm sure. Uh, well, I'll show you in a second. Uh, Hattie Trust, Internet Archive, Google Books. Now, if you're doing library research, it's important to remember that over time, the word that was used to catalog cookbooks has changed. So it used to be cookery. That's a word we all use, right? But now it could be cookbook. It could be food writing. It could be food history, food ways, culinary. You get the idea community cookbook, church cookbook. So as you search on library card catalogs, you want to search by the place name and then one of these words to see what uh, historic cookbooks were uh, indexed, what words were used for your time and place that you're researching. And then, like I said, there are digitized book websites. This isn't all of them, but I just want to give you a sense uh, a lot of you are from outside of the U.S. Google has various uh, websites for, ver for the different countries. They also have digitized books. Uh, so you might want to check Google and Google Books. Hattie Trust is primarily a U.S. resource, though the books that are housed in the U.S. cover the world. Now, as you're searching these sites, obviously, if you're searching for a cookbook in a different country, you're going to want to use that language. So if it's Italian, you want to put it, uh, put the term in Italian so that you find those cookbooks. Now, the nice thing about Hattie Trust is it's a lot of academic institutions. Academic institutions do have culinary collections from around the world, so that can be a useful resource for you. And then Internet Archive, uh, they not only scan various books, but they have people and institutions that upload them. And if you go to Internet Archive, <coughs> you click on that orange book, 
There is a uh, food collection, a culinary collection that you could look just there, or you could do an overall search. Now, I want to end by giving you an example of another example of how you could incorporate food history into your family history right now. And you could start right now. Now, this, the one I chose, this was kind of difficult thinking about the worldwide audience and what is an experience, you know, a lot of people have had or their families have had. So, I'm going to use the World War II experience. And obviously, you may have family that perished in World War II, uh, the Holocaust. And so food has a different meaning in that uh, experience. You may have family that lived in an area where food su supplies were diminished and taken away so people were starving. You may have family who uh, food rationing was something that happened. We had that in the U.S. We had that in England where food commodities because of uh, the inability to ship them safely and to feed other nations and soldiers were cut off a little bit. So I'm going to use rationing, but please remember that you could use this example or something similar for World War II or a difficult time in your family's uh, history. So in the United States, food rationing really didn't start with World War II. People during World War I were encouraged in the United States to self-ration. So they were, in, uh, they were encouraged to do without certain foods or substitute various foods in order to feed people in Europe and to feed the Allied forces. And so these kinds of propaganda posters were used telling Americans uh, they wanted to get them away from white flour, so using corn or cornmeal. They wanted them to eat all their food and not um, waste food. And then they wanted them to go out without things like sugar and meat. Now, for some people, this was everyday life. They lived in impoverished areas in the United States, and so they didn't go, they didn't have access to those foods. But for others, that did help them, encourage them to change their eating habits. And so cookbooks were created, ads went into the newspapers and so forth to encourage Americans to help with the war effort by uh, denying them certain foods. Now, World War II, what happened was we can no longer just hope that people did the right thing. We had to make them do the right thing. And that's where we got ration books. And in England, food rationing happened uh, for a longer period of time than it did here in the United States. So these ration coupons, along with money, that uh, impacted how much you can buy and what you could buy were implemented. And they weren't just implemented for foodstuffs. They were also implemented for things like tires and shoes because of rubber and the inability to uh, bring rubber into the United States, the danger in shipping that. Uh, gasoline was also rationed. New cars were rationed so that those uh, factories could make tanks and, and other things for the war effort. So what happened was Americans were issued a book. There were four different books uh, per person. And you could use those coupons, and I showed you another example of the coupons there. Uh, the newspaper would tell you when you could use it and what you could use it for. Now, it wasn't uh, just, here's my coupons, give me a steak. It was, here's my however many coupons, and then let me pay this other. So there, it, was, it wasn't just a matter of uh, a trade. You also had to purchase the item. Now, just to give you a sense of when this was happening in the U.S., and like I said, in England, it was a longer time period, but in uh, November 1942, for example, coffee was rationed. In March 93, dairy and meat was rationed, and this would change over time. Sometimes it would stop, and then it would start again, uh, but all rationing ended in 47. I believe in England, it went into the 1950s. 
Now, that was, a, I've, I've just simplified it, but it was a fairly complex system. And if you're interviewing a family member about it, it, it may be hard to understand. So we go to the newspaper and the newspaper provides advertisements during this time period for grocery stores, for example, that explain the rationing system. And it would explain what was rationed that week, what wasn't rationed and what you could purchase. And so this would have helped families understand what they could and couldn't get. There was also propaganda posters, government posters that explained it as well so that you did it correctly. Um, ration books were extremely important. In fact, if you lost them, you had to report it was lost. There would be an advertisement in the uh, back of the newspaper with the names of different people who lost their ration books. Uh, kind of as a warning to others not to pick them up and try to use them because the grocer was supposed to make sure that you were using your ration books. So this is another way that they understood what was rationed and what wasn't. There was cookbooks, there was all kinds of things that would have helped. And this is from the newspaper. This is a ration timetable that told you what stamps to use for what commodities. And then there were booklets and cookbooks and all kinds of things. So if you have an ancestor who this would have affected, how could you incorporate that into your family history? Well, if you still have the ration book, you could digitize that. You could look up what were those coupons used for. You could ask them. What was that like to have your food rationed? How did it affect you after the war? Did you start using various recipes that you were familiar with during the war? <clears throat> were there celebrations that, um, that were maybe uh, curtailed or became different because you couldn't make cake, for example? So those are things that you could ask. Now, if you wanted to start today and document your family's World War II food experience, you could document lack of food, what was missing, what was substituted. You could talk about food rationing. Starvation is something that you could talk about. That was a really, um, you know, obviously lots of people starved during World War II people who were in concentration camps, people who were POWs. There's all kinds of examples of that. People having to eat foods that we may not think of as acceptable. Uh, for example, some people in the United States would sell horse meat uh, in place of ground beef because that was rationed. <clears throat> and so some people today would find that unacceptable, but that happens during wartime. And so there's all kinds of ways that you could start your food history, family history documentation today by looking at what historically your family has gone through and what memories they may have. Now, there's other ways you can do it as well. You could document your food-related heirlooms. You could document your family recipes show someone cooking those recipes and document that if if they don't know you know how many teaspoons or tablespoons you know videotape them making it and see if that helps uh create a family cookbook ask everybody to submit recipes ask questions start asking them now even if you're the older generation ask your siblings or your cousins sometimes other people in the family are the ones who are gifted heirlooms or who are the ones listening to those stories and that can be helpful as you put together these stories for your family history i want to end with this thought you know, often in genealogy, we bemoan the fact that other people don't like genealogy in our family. In fact, I read something on Twitter uh, today. Some guy said he wasn't interested in genealogy because it's something that old people do. But think about what does interest people in your family. Stories, right? They like to go to the movies. They like to watch, you know, TV. They like to read, play video games. Those are stories. Food is something we all relate to. We all eat. So 
doing some food history with your family history makes it more interesting to your family and helps you, you know, take your family history and, you know, gift it to the other members of your family. All right. So there's a few thoughts about food history and family history. Esther, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. First of all, thank you, Gina. Uh, that was so fascinating. And I love, I love seeing the examples of some of those old recipes, things that I would probably not eat nowadays. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> That's so interesting to see. Wow. Um, we we received some really nice comments. I just wanted to read a few comments before we get to the questions just to uh, to read for everyone out there. Um, let's see. Um, we have uh, Laurice. She said, one of my treasures is a recipe for Christmas pudding for my Scottish great-great-grandmother that she wrote on notebook paper in pencil for my grandmother. That's a, a treasure. <laughs> it is. And I'll tell you, Esther, um, one thing that I've seen people do is to preserve that handwriting. They digitize it. And you can do everything from obviously framing it to there are some companies that will print it on cloth. Or uh, you can buy yardage of fabric and make things, or uh, you can have it printed on tea towels or pot holders or cups or whatever, and give them as gifts during Christmas. I was going to ask. Um, I saw a bunch of comments here about um, you know having the written, handwritten recipes, and and I was going to ask how, what's the best way that you think to to preserve those, especially if they're written in the original handwriting of you know your great grandmother. Definitely something you want to preserve for future generations. You do. And um, are they still seeing my slides? No, not anymore. Okay, that's okay. Um, so on one of the slides, I had those old recipes on index cards. And as you know, over time, uh, there's a problem with paper. It's acidic. And if they're touching each other, it causes some issues. <coughs> Sorry about that. So what you can do is um, you can go to an archival uh, supply place online and get special... Um, hold on a second. <coughs> okay. No Food way. makes me cough. <laughs> you can get special sheet protectors for recipe cards. I would also digitize them and scan them. And um, put them in those special sheet protectors. Okay, that's yeah, that's great advice. Not to just uh, cook from them on a daily basis and let them get egg and flour <laughs> all over. Well, and if they're they're sitting together, that acid is going to you know destroy each of the cards. And I actually showed a wooden recipe box. That's going to cause problems. So getting archival materials to protect those is going to be important. So digitize them and then put them in archival safe materials. Okay, good advice. Uh, Linda said, hello from New Jersey. We were blessed with wonderful Italian American grandmothers, moms and aunts who are fabulous cooks and bakers. So many great recipes have been handed down through the generations. Great presentation. So Linda, don't... Um, don't forget to record all those great recipes and, and not to just uh, rely on them being known in the family at this point, of course. And, um, you know, I think, too, even if there's stuff, obviously Italian food, hey, that's the best, right? But even if there's foods that your, your family ate that you would not eat today, that's still important. In fact, there was a young man who recorded his grandma, Clara, uh, cooking different foods from the Depression era. And he did a YouTube channel. He wrote a book about it. So even the foods that you wouldn't eat, like my great-grandmother's mincemeat pie, uh, is still important to record and kind of to show your family, this is what we used to eat. This is why we don't eat it anymore. So interesting. 
Uh, Marianne says, the photo of the deviled eggs immediately got me thinking. They are popular in my family, and I'll never forget my grandmother's cornbread stuffing. Mm. Yes, yes. And, you know, think about those foods that are popular in your family over the generations. Deviled eggs, you know, probably for a lot of Americans might be one of those foods. But that's something your kids and your grandkids need to know about. Why do we eat this? This is why. Cornbread stuffing, that's not something we eat in California. Or largely don't. I shouldn't speak for all Californians. But um, obviously that has roots in the South. Uh, just like oyster stuffing. That's something that uh, New England and that area. So different kinds of foods aren't universal to all places. So that's important to document. I see that Cheryl wrote here, thank you, Gina. Inspired to scan my community cookbooks and the cookbooks we made as fundraisers when I was a girl, guys. Yeah, never too early. So I, I think definitely people are going to go home with a little bit of homework to, <laughs> to work on all their family recipes. Um, let's see, uh, Kathy says, is there a recommended site for a list of food equivalents when cooking an old recipe with modern ingredients? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, you know what, I'd have to look. I know there are, but I don't know if one right off the top of my head. Okay, uh, Karen asks, would there be any legal problems posting recipes on an online family tree that came, say, from a church fundraising book that was purchased by you at the time of the fundraiser? You know, that's an excellent question. And I think that if you were just going to do the recipe and maybe, you know, do a good source citation, you should be fine. If you were scanning the whole book and putting it online, that wouldn't be okay, obviously. But if you're just going to show one and uh, do the source citation, you should be fine. That's also a question that when we think about putting together family cookbooks, and maybe what we want to take from different cookbooks, we need to keep in mind, uh, you know, we, we want to be cognizant of copyright infringement and, um, and cider sources. So you don't want to just take things. But if it's one recipe and you cite your sources, that should be fine. Uh, Donna put up a comment similar to your story, Gina, that you mentioned earlier. She says, my grandmother raised rabbits in a hutch in her backyard. When my brother and I were very young, we named the rabbits and carried them around and played with them. One day the rabbits disappeared. We were told supper that night was chicken, but somehow we knew what it really was and no one could eat the meat that night. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when my mom told me that story about her mom and her brothers, I can definitely see my grandma doing that. And uh, it just shows you how life is different, because obviously if I did that to my kids, they wouldn't be too thrilled with me. <laughs> so um, but you can understand. And Donna, I'm assuming that that happened because she needed the meat. They weren't pets. They were they were food. And so it's yeah, I'm you need to write that story down. That's great. <laughs> that definitely should be recorded in your My Heritage Family Tree. That's definitely. right. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, we'll just take uh, one last question before we get to our draw for today. Uh, this question is from Karen, and she asks, Gina, could taste preference be genetic? I grew up in the Midwest, but have always loved Southern, Southern cooking. We never ate that at my house growing up. But through my genealogy research, I found my ancestors for 150 years lived in the mountains of Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee. Of course, they ate Southern cooking. What do you think? <laughs> it's an interesting, an interesting question. That is interesting. And I've heard other people make similar remarks that, you know, they were the only person in their family that liked a certain country's food. I know that's true for my family. I like stuff that my mother thinks I'm crazy for eating. I think it's an interesting idea, but I, I would also maybe assume that perhaps you're a little more adventurous food wise. Some people are not adventurous and different things taste good to, to you know, certain people. So um, I like the idea. I wouldn't mind trying that out, but I'm not so sure about it. <laughs> Um, this was just so fascinating. I think such a great topic and just 
so many different facets of it. We, we really loved learning about this. I see so many comments here about really loving the presentation uh, and learning so much. And for anyone who missed any of it, just a reminder that it's all available on the MyHeritage Facebook page, facebook.com slash MyHeritage uh, under the video section. So if you missed any of it or you'd like to rewatch it or send it around to your friends and family, please do share it around. Um, and we hope that they all appreciate it as much as, as, much as we did. Uh, we'll give away the draw today for the MyHeritage Complete Plan, the best plan we have to offer at MyHeritage. We're very excited uh, to give it away today to one lucky winner. Uh, and the winner is Karen Harrison. So Karen wrote us, uh, yep, she, um, she wrote a great comment here. She wrote, we did a family letter that passed from person years ago and each person added a recipe from their own collection or from an ancestor. Then when I had about a hundred recipes and all those letters that we did about every two to three months, I took it all and made a family cookbook with the letters and I gave it to all the contributors for Christmas. Oh, I love that. That is so fabulous. Lovely, such a nice idea. And I like that it has kind of a mix of, uh, you know, of present recipes, recipes from the contributors themselves, but also from the ancestors together. Lovely, great idea, Karen. Yeah. And hopefully we can all adapt something similar. Definitely, we could start now for Christmas in what, 10 yep. months or whatever, 11 months. No time like the present. That's right. <laughs> So congratulations, Karen, and we'll be in touch with you through private message to claim your prize. Gina, thank you again. Really, really fascinating session, and we love having you on our show. Thank you, Esther, for having me, and thanks, everybody. It's great to be here. Bye, everybody. Have a great day.